You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. This is Nagel and Knowles. Everyone has the right to feel physically and psychologically safe in their workplace. The multidimensional team of Nagel and Knowles will discuss the process for helping organizations with this growing problem that we face in our society today. From a simple lack of respect in the workplace to bullying to extreme violence, Nagel and Knowles will create a more healthy and harmonious atmosphere. So now, please welcome Nagel and Knowles, your workplace violence prevention experts. Welcome, everyone. I'm Richard Knowles of Nagel and Knowles, your workplace violence risk reduction experts. I'm joined today with one of my partners and my wife, Claire Knowles. And we're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're pleased that you're with us to discuss the importance of reducing the risks of workplace violence. We at Nagel and Knowles offer a complete range of skills from site risk assessment to situational awareness training to active shooter training and cultural surveys, to developing stronger HR procedures and training for legal compliance, to training to eliminate bullying and sexual harassment, to evaluating the leadership approach and to developing more effective leadership strategies to reduce the risks of workplace violence. Our offerings are the gold standard in reducing the risks of workplace violence. Today, the audience that will most benefit from this show, which is titled, As the World Turns, Partner-Centered Leadership, it is so needed, big time. So the audience the most likely benefit will be managers and supervisors in all sort of functions like manufacturing, safety, engineering, accounting, and HR. This broadcast is for people who have responsibility for other people in their organization. Leaders, let me say leaders, are the people who set and enforce the standards and the expectations for the organization. So today we're going to focus on the role of strong, effective leadership, with a particular emphasis on using partner-centered leadership to create that healthy, respectful, and profitable workplace. In previous broadcasts, we have talked about the penny metaphor. Now, if you look at a penny, you see on one side the face of Lincoln, and on the other side, a picture of the Lincoln Memorial, the building. The side with the Lincoln's picture represents the people, the HR side of reducing workplace violence, which is where I add my special expertise. And the side with the picture of the Lincoln Memorial represents the site security and physical assets side which is our partner Robin Nagel's area of special expertise. But continuing on with that penny metaphor, the copper that's holding both sides together represents leadership, and it's often the hidden overlooked part of reducing the risk of workplace violence. Leadership is Richard's area of special expertise. So let's start right in. Richard, could you share with us why leadership is so important for building a successful, healthy, and respectful workplace environment? Leadership's about working with the people to develop the changes that are needed to create and sustain a healthy, respectful workplace and build a profitable business free of dysfunctional behaviors like bullying and sexual harassment. Leadership needs to come from the top. Leaders must take a stand that they will not tolerate any forms of bullying and sexual harassment. They need to talk with the people about this and discuss it thoroughly. They must also be willing to enforce this stand so that everyone knows and understands what it all means. The discussion needs to be done talking respectfully with the people, not scolding them. Talking with the people is a key to effective leadership. Helping the people to see that this is important 
not only for the good of the people, it's critical for the good of the business. It's good for the people because it helps them to have an environment where it's okay to talk together, share information, and explore better ways to do things. When information is shared and people are talking and learning together, everyone can learn and grow. And it's good for the business because as people talk together and share, great energy and creativity are released. People find meaning in their work. When this happens, all sorts of improvement opportunities open up for the organization. People can eliminate waste, find better ways to get the work done, and work together in the most efficient way. Richard, this sounds like a very different way of leading than the traditional ways that I've been exposed to early in my career, and then I think many people experience. Most of the time, I was told what my assignment was, what I was to do, who I could talk to, and just do my job. Check my brain at the door. My bosses knew what I was supposed to do and how to do it. I was just supposed to follow the orders. But often, when I got into the job or different tasks, I found that things were not as they had told me. And I was supposed to invent ways to solve the problems and not ask the boss any questions. I didn't want to look bad, so I did not ask questions, and I struggled through. But most of the time, I was able to get through, but it did not really feel good working that way. I was always vulnerable. If I made a mistake, and perhaps I would be blamed for messing up because the managers were in charge. And of course they were. Earlier, Richard, you said that managing was not sufficient and that leading was a much better way to go. Could you talk some more about that? To lead this way requires a new mindset in how we approach things. The people in the organization need to be seen as valued, as real people, not just parts of a machine. But the traditional mindset is one where people are seen as instruments to be used to get the best results for the organization. This is the approach used in managing where managers want to have reliability, predictability, control, and stability in their organizations. People are told what to do and are expected to comply with management's directives. Talking at the people tends to push them away and they do not listen. They often do not feel valued and get very frustrated and angry. In this sort of a culture, the people begin to turn on each other and things get very ugly. Clicks form. Some people are insiders and some are outsiders to the group. Respect for each other is limited and without respect, bullying and harassment occur. About half the bullying is from the supervisors and managers, which is a very hard on everyone. The poor behavior just gets worse and worse as time rolls on. Some people become tar- targets for really vicious bullying and harassment, and over time, they can become very depressed and angry. This is the process for growing your homegrown shooters. When I was a plant manager for over 10 years, I often wondered why putting a nice group of people into an organization often resulted in cliques, insiders and outsiders, and bullying and harassment. I've come to understand this, and it comes about in trying to manage and control everything and keep people in their little organizational boxes and shutting down the sharing of information. This is the way that you, Claire, were treated in your earlier work experiences. In this way of working, there's a big gap between work as imagined and work as done. I have studied this for over 25 years, and I've developed a particular way of leading I call partner-centered leadership. It's a new mindset that's needed for the organization to become the best it can be and to survive and grow. The shift in mindset and moving to partner-centered leadership is like throwing off a wet blanket and letting the light and air come in. Then people can see what's going on, learn about the business challenges and the competition, see better ways to do things, work together more safely and respectfully and to help each other. But a big challenge that comes with throwing off the blanket is keeping the organization focused, helping it to get stronger and more sustainable. As things open up, the business can fragment and fall apart as everyone goes in different directions and the business can die. The people need to come together in a dynamical way so that both the people and the business thrive and grow. We're coming up to a break. After the break, we'll be talking about how we can have both the people and the business side of the come together and have the business survive and thrive and grow. It's an exciting way to lead. You're listening to us live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're Nagel and Knowles, your workplace risk reduction experts. We'll be right back. 
Certified professional coach Pamela Reeves can help you with your relationships. Motivational and image coaching are just some of the ways she can help you enhance all aspects of your life. Her book, Is It Love or Merely a Sick Attachment, helps readers clearly distinguish healthy, loving relationships from toxic ones. Ms. Reeves has put her words into action through Ray of Hope Kenya, an international initiative that provides outreach to victims of abusive relationships there with the goal of helping them rebuild their lives and the tools to avoid abuse. Ms. Reeves operates various business interest through her umbrella network, Nella LLC, and credits her success to her diverse work experience. Whatever your goals, whether striking a balance, reinventing your image, or simply lifting your lifestyle, Pamela Reeves will help you achieve them. Your life, your call. Dial 410-902-5715 or email Pamela at pamreg01 at verizon.net. She's also on the web at pamreeves.com and on Twitter at Pamela underscore Reeves. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and to in radio. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Richard and Claire Knowles of Nagel Knowles, your workplace violence risk reduction experts. And this morning, we've been talking particularly about partner-centered leadership, which is one of the keys to reducing your risks of workplace violence. You're listening to us live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. Before the break, I was talking about shifting the leadership mindset and throwing off the wet blanket of traditional top-down management. We open up the organization, letting fresh air and light into our organization by using the partner-centered leadership approach. Partner-centered leadership is a process of how we choose to engage with the people to build stronger, healthier, more respectful, more sustainable businesses. The key in opening up the organization and simultaneously maintaining order and focus is for the leaders to be very clear about the mission and vision for the business, build on shared values, and abundantly share information about all aspects of the work. Then ask the people to help and come together for us all to achieve our goals. And this has to be authentic. We use the right approach by opening up the organization, building an environment where it's okay for people to ask questions and talk together and share and learn. We treat each other with respect in all we do. Respect is seen as going into the, our organizations every day and talking with people, listening and learning together, sitting together with a cup of coffee and listening to them and exchange ideas together, learning and helping everyone to better understand the business. For example, I would walk into the plant every day and wander from one area to another. I would stop and talk with someone I met. I'd pick up trash. I would often go into a control room or office with a cup of coffee and be with the people. I would talk about their work and ask them how I could help them do it better. We would talk about the importance of high quality and doing things right. We'd talk about how the business was doing and who our competitors were. The conversations were focused on the people. How can we get better? How can I help them and how important their work is for the success of the whole business? I often asked them for their help and ideas because I did not know everything and needed their help. Conversations certainly are key, aren't they, to the relationships. So using the right approach sounds really good, Richard. How did your thinking change, though, as you developed this way of working? During this work at the plant and in the years since, I've been consulting and working with many organizations, and I've discovered just how important and fundamental the ongoing conversations really are for the success of the whole and keeping the organization together and focused. My old thinking really had to change. I came to realize that organizations behave as if they're living systems. 
I see organizations as complex, adapting, self-organizing networks of people. The ongoing conversations are the links that hold the network together and strengthen it. Change happens one conversation at a time. I've pulled all this together into the dynamical organizations theory, openness, synthesis, and emergence. In the openness of sharing new ideas and as thinking develops, we all, I mean all the people at all the levels in the organization, talk together and share. The ideas begin to synthesize into new strategies and potentialities, and solutions begin to emerge. In this process, we're co-creating our shared future. I like that, co-creating, Richard, and this sounds really good. Because the conversation is the basis of the relationship. But how do you maintain the focus? With all those conversations, don't people begin to go all over the place and get scattered? You know, people will come up with all sorts of ideas. And and I would expect you'd want to follow up on so many of them. But how do you keep the focus and the operating discipline to keep the organization together and the business growing at the same time so that you can value those conversations? We keep the focus and operating discipline by walking about and talking about what we're doing. We talk together about the people issues as well as the business issues. We talk about why we are doing things. We talk together about the business, our injury reduction performance, our environmental performance, the customers and competition. We also talk about how their families are doing. Is everyone well? How's school going? If the need for support surfaces, we look for ways to help them. As we talked about the business and our strategies, sometimes differences of opinion would surface about how to go about achieving our goals. We talked about these. Sometimes things got heated, but these were there were no personal attacks and we treated each other with respect. Sometimes as I walked around, when we'd get into these tough conversations, I would explain my thinking and listen for their ideas. Now and then I'd change my own opinion as I learned with them. When I made mistakes, I would apologize and try to get better. And I would often ask them for their help as I was trying to learn to change. We all learned to help each other. As people began to make decisions about their own performance and areas of work, we all grew and got better. And I'd support them in this work. And sometimes we made mistakes and we learned from them. Always the focus was both the people and the business. During these conversations, we all discovered deeper meaning in our work and what we could do to contribute to improving our overall success. You've talked about the right approach, Richard, the right thinking, and the right focus. Were there any special tools that you used to help with this transformation to partner-centered leadership? Yes. As I mentioned earlier, organizations are complex, adapting, self-organizing networks of people. I discovered several tools that help us to live in our complex world. One tool is the process enneagram which is a tool that helps us to work on an important, complex problem or issue. Anything that has a number of relatively independent interacting parts is a complex system. There is a lot of scientific literature on the theory of complex systems, and the process enneagram is the bridge between these theories and practical application. In using these tools, a cross-section of people come together to talk about the particular issue. This is a disciplined, focused process which all enables people to listen and learn and to get better and to solve their problems. I've written a best-selling book called The Leadership Dance, which is available on Amazon. Another tool is the bowl. The bowl is a metaphorical container that holds the organization together. It is developed as people work together through the process Enneagram process. The bowl is our mission, vision, standards of behavior, and performance. These are also the things that I talked about as I wandered the plant. When people know and understand the bowl, they can operate with a lot of freedom to make the decisions they need to do their own work more effectively. And this closes the gap between work as imagined and work as done. The third tool I developed relates to how to improve decisions that we are making so that they'll be better and more sustainable. I call this tool the sustainability ratios. There are six of the ratios we use, and I'll use one for illustration. As we're considering a decision, we ask ourselves, will this decision make us more flexible or less flexible? Normally, being more flexible is better in the long run. We consider all six of the ratios in our decisions, and we use them in a number of management decisions as we move forward, and we got better and better as we moved. We're coming up to a break. You're listening to us live on the BBM Global Network, 
and Tune In Radio. This is Claire and Richard Knowles of Nagel Knowles, your workplace risk reduction experts. We'll be back in a moment. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Nagel and Knowles of Nagel Knowles and Associates, your workplace violence reduction, risk reduction experts. We're coming to you live on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And before the break, Richard was specifically talking about the tools that can be used in the whole world of applying partner-centered leadership. So, Richard, in using these tools, can you tell us what these process of engagement were that you used? The process we used is one of engagement of conversations, learning together, making decisions, and acting on them reflecting on the outcome of the decisions, and learning from what actually happened. The basic process I used was walking around the plant, which I did for five hours a day, every day. Sometimes it was in the middle of the night to engage with the people. This is a big part of the mindset change that I had to make in order to lead this way. In engaging this way, the people could see that I cared. They also saw me on days when things were going well, as well on days when things were not going well. Wow. You walk the plant for five hours a day, every day? That's amazing. Does everyone need to walk the plant that many hours a day? It depends on how large the facility is and how strong the need for change really is. For us, it was a big deal, so I had to do it like this. Often, I'll recommend that leaders spend at least two hours every day in the plant talking with people. This is a real mindset change. This is a big change for leaders. And why do they really need to do this? That is, in developing this discipline for ongoing conversations with their people. As I mentioned earlier, this is the way that the wet blanket can be torn away and still keep things focused and moved to improve both the business and the people. Our business performance really improved much better than we had imagined. Our injury rates dropped by over 96%. Our emissions to the environment dropped by about 95%. Our productivity rose about 45%, and our earnings rose over 300%. I later learned that my top corporate management was considering shutting the plant down and having about 1,200 people face losing their jobs. We saved the plant and most of the jobs. Changes like these are far better than any I had gotten in my old top-down management days. And the payoff for the people and the business was terrific. So your purpose in using the partner-centered leadership was to help the people and the business to become the very best that they could be. So it looks as if all of you together really accomplished a lot, and that is quite the story. 
So you were talking about the right reasons for using partner-centered leadership, using the right approach, the right thinking, the right focus, the right tools, the right processes, the right reasons, and for the right purpose. This process strengthens and builds both the people and the business sides of the business because it holds everything together as the energy and the creativity of the people are released. So let's do some more, Dick. Would you tell us why partner-centered leadership works so well? It works so well because there's a lot of thinking that we need to get clear and aligned. We try to get rid of the confusion. And it's really important that the leaders get very clear and aligned on their vision, mission, and values and what way they want to lead. These values must be real and sincere, and they have to be lived every day. The process is about conversations and how the organization changes one conversation at a time. It's critical that the leaders are all on the same page with their conversations so that confusion and misunderstanding are not a problem. The best way for this to happen is to use the process Enneagram and build a bowl. As the leaders develop their process Enneagram Mac, their conversations follow nine specific steps, looking at first their identity. Who are they? Then their intention. What are they trying to do? Third, we begin to talk about the issues and ambiguities and problems they're facing. Four, we talk about their relationships. Do they trust each other or not? We talk about their principles and standards of behavior and how are they actually operating. And we talk about the actual physical work that they're doing. And then we talk about how they'll create and share new information. At the eighth, we talk about how we're going to keep learning. And nine, how they want to organize themselves. The answers and insights about each point are recorded onto the Process Enneagram map, providing them with a living strategic plan. A key piece of this is their principles and standards of behavior. Here they are taking their stand about how they want to lead and work together. In discussing their principles and standards is where their values become explicitly made and made clear, and strong agreements are made between themselves. This is co-created so they all can hold each other accountable and live up to their agreements. The mindset shift to being in serious conversations with all the people Every day must be clearly stated in their principles and standards. Leaders must make their process Enneagram map open and public to everyone. This way it can be discussed and used to create the bowl. Leaders need to ask the people to hold them accountable, to live up to their agreements, and then listen to their input. Sometimes we messed up so we had to listen hard and really get better. Let me reemphasize the importance of all of this. As Richard and I have worked around the world, and yes, I said around the world, we have found that most people want to be treated with one respect. Richard has talked a lot about this earlier, and it's so important. Two, they want to be listened to. They know that their ideas and thoughts may not work, and they expect this. However, they want to be heard and have their ideas at least considered. Three, they want to be accepted and be part of the group. Inclusion. Being a part of something important is a big motivator for people. And four, people want to be treated fairly. And this means that they need to know what's going on around them, why things are happening like they do, and what it means to them. And this is about the relationships between and among themselves and the leaders. And when leaders care and have the courage to address situations, then the people know that they're cared about. Five, people want to be part of the conversations about things that affect them. They want to be part of the decision-making. The more opportunity for people to talk about their work, to listen and learn together, the better their decisions will be. And when they understand the metaphor of the bowl, the container that holds all their principles and standards, then their decisions will usually be very good. Most people want to be winners. And that's number six. They want to be part of a winning team. They want to be supported by and to support each other. Becoming their brothers and sisters keepers is important so that they can protect each other's backs. We have found these characteristics across all the cultures in which we have worked. We've been in the U.S., all over, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, China, Malaysia, Italy, and other places. And as we have worked with partner-centered leadership, we've come to realize that these conversations need to be deep and sincere and authentic. They need to be going on every day. 
Just checking off that you talk with a few people does not cut it. This is a way of life and a new mindset. So now we're coming up on a break, and when we return on the other side, we're going to be talking some more about partner-centered leadership. Stay tuned. We will be right back. French Rastafarian baker Chef Hugues Mott is a fourth-generation baker and has worked in 11 countries across three continents. Born in Mulhouse, France, he began apprenticing in his father's bakery at age 12 and has devoted his life to learning cultures of the world from inside kitchens across the globe. He also teaches traditional French baking by hosting demonstrations and classes, and his passion for baking is reflected in his delicious confections. With a deep respect for discipline and his Rastafarian way of life, Chef Uvmat exemplifies commitment to tradition and culture in a global world. Traveling extensively and combining a myriad of flavors into his recipes, Chef Ugmat brings a unique approach to baking. To read more about the French Rastafarian baker, visit www.frenchchefoug.com. That's H-U-G-U-E-S. Bon appétit and bless up. Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knudsen's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knudsen is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story, is a triumphant achievement, and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. Welcome back, everyone. This is Richard and Claire Knowles of Nagel and Knowles, your workplace violence risk reduction experts. You're listening to us on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Before the break, I was talking about this new mindset and talking a lot about walking around. In walking around and talking with the people, I'm not suggesting that we have to talk to everyone every day. As we talk to people, the word gets around, the rumors spread, the people keep talking. One way I used to get the word out was by weekly business meetings. I held two one-hour meetings on Wednesday mornings in different shops, production areas, or offices. I talked about our safety and environmental performance, as well as our business situations, for about 10 minutes. Then I opened up the meeting to questions. Every question was okay, and every question was answered. If I did not know the answer, I promised I would find out the answer and get back to them. And I always did. My secretary took notes of the meetings, and we published the notes to the whole plant within 36 hours, so everyone knew what was going on. Interacting with the people is not a spectator sport, and sometimes the meetings got pretty intense. I stayed in the heat, and things kept getting better and better. I talked so much, I had to be careful to tell the truth as best I could, and if conditions changed or circumstances changed, and what I had said no longer applied, I had to go to the people and tell them what had changed and why. This way, I kept my integrity whole. You can't play with the truth in partner-centered leadership. So how did the bowl, which is the metaphoric container for holding all your operating standards and your disciplinary principles of behavior, how did that bowl help you in all these interactions? The bowl was a very important way to help hold things together to maintain focus and discipline. None of us knew what was going on on the plant all the time. We're a big plant, and we covered a lot of territory, and we worked 24-7. I learned that as people worked within the bowl, I didn't have to know everything myself about what was happening. As long as everyone stayed within the bowl, we were okay. Learning to live with this ambiguity was not easy for me. The most effective and confident people began to make better and better decisions and became stronger and stronger. And people did extraordinary things. For example, when we had gone to teams, people had to be on their work group team, but they could also be on site-wide teams. And Becky, a shift worker and operator, was on these site environmental teams, and she wanted things to get better and better. 
One morning I got a call from Becky because she'd gotten upset in listening to this talk show as she came to work to start a 6 a.m. shift. These guys were talking about the pollution from our plant. That night the moon was shining, our steam plumes were glistening white. They thought it was chemicals, and Becky knew it was water. So the next part of the conversation went, so I called them up, and they're coming to the plant next Monday. They'll be here three hours. I want you to take care of the first hour, and here's what you talk about, and I'll take care of the other two. It was one of the best visits we ever had. Now I was reporting and doing what a shift worker told me to do. In another example, our shift supervisor, Donnie, was working one night, and we had a terrible electrical storms. He kept the plant running, but then finally decided that things had gotten so bad, he'd better shut it down to prevent any fires or environmental upsets. And when I came in at 6 a.m. to begin talking with him, he told me he shut the plant down because even the day it was being forecast to be very heavy. This was a quarter of a million dollar decision that Donnie made on his own, and I supported him through all of this. That's a great story. Actually, those are great stories, Richard. This work is real, and the results do come from the people. It's important to note that you all learn to work together using partner-centered leadership, and this is very impressive. Can you share some more examples of how people learned and grew and becoming more and more effective as, as the bowl grew? We had a number of different success stories, and one of the early ones was by Steve, who was an asbestos insulator and also in charge of our asbestos insulating safety team. Every month, our central safety committee would meet and different committees would report out. And one day, Steve reported out that he'd called up the EPA to find out what they were learning about asbestos and what they were doing. I was stunned. Here they're calling the people that can put me in jail, and he hadn't even talked to me about it. Yet he had done the right thing, and I had to hold my stomach and keep my mouth shut as he made his report. And afterwards, I figured Steve knew more about asbestos than I ever would, and they never called back, so it was all right. Another time I was out in the plant walking around and ran into Eddie, a mechanic who had been assigned to look after four or five contractors on a small job. He kicked them off the plant on his own because they were not following safety procedures. That was a great step forward and really a good thing for him to have done. Another problem we had, which was a bigger problem, was having too many empty tank trucks sitting around the plant. When a customer, when a supplier would supply us with a tank truck of methanol, for example, and we unload it, people would just leave the tank truck in the back lot. Well, the problem with that is you have to pay the vendor $10 an hour every hour, hour after hour. And we had so many tank trucks sitting around that our bill had gotten to the point of $800,000 a year. And while I complained about it, nobody paid attention. Until one day after we had gone to teams, the operators decided that they could get rid of the trucks. So they called up the truck suppliers and told them to move the trucks, and off they went. And our cost immediately dropped from $800,000 a year to about 100000 A great step forward, which the operators did, and I had been unable to make happen. Another piece of this work is going out to be with the people to see where they are and how they work. I call, walked the coal conveyor one day to see how that worked and what was involved. I also climbed the distillation column to see what it was like up there. I did it on a nice sunny day in the summer. But these times, some of the people have to do that in the winter. But at least I had some sense of what this was about. These are all stories of personally engaging with them, each other. And I had to be persistent. I had to show caring. I had to show that I was concerned for the people, the business, and the plant. And I had to show that I was committed to keeping my word and doing what I promised. And as a result of this, extraordinary change happened. I just love those stories, Richard. And indeed, the people who were living and going to work and feeling like partner-centered in people in the business and doing that, I'm sure they felt very good too. Because the bottom line is this. Leaders can achieve a balance for both meeting and exceeding business objectives while they are developing an environment 
for nourishing the human spirit and developing the potency of people. That's what partner-centered leadership is. Let me say that again. Leaders can achieve a balance for meeting and exceeding business objectives while developing an environment for nourishing the human spirit and developing the potency of their people. That's partner-centered leadership. We're coming up on a break, and when we come back to the other side, we're going to be talking more because partner-centered leadership is so key to reducing the risk of workplace violence. Please stay tuned. We will be right back. Are you looking for employment and live in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is the place for you. Are you an employer looking to fill a position or quite a few positions in Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties? Jobs Annex is for you. Employers, JobsAnnex.com is your resource for career-minded people. JobsAnnex.com is the convenient place for job seekers and employers to hook up and move forward. Jobs Annex has been serving Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties for over 14 years. Years. Jobs Annex is a former employment search firm. We've evaluated many thousands of resumes and we understand what employers want and what job applicants need to be successful in their interviews. At Jobs Annex, we provide you with the tools to tell your story for free. Our resources at JobsAnnex.com will help each applicant construct an award-winning resume, an eye-catching cover letter, and key interview questions to ask in various types of interviews. Best of all, it's free. JobsAnnex.com. That's J-O-B-S-A-N-N-E-X.com. If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Richard and Claire Knowles of Nagel Knowles and Associates.com, your workplace violence prevention experts. We're coming to you over the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Before the break, Richard was telling us some stories, really great stories about how partner-centered leadership opened up the organization and how people step forward to make important decisions. And now we'd like to talk about how organizations really do change, one conversation at a time. I shared earlier that organizations behave as if they're living systems. They're complex, adapting, self-organizing networks of people. The patterns and processes in an organization can be best understood from a complex adaptive systems perspective. The simple way to think about this is to consider a group of people interacting all the time, adapting and changing as the conditions around them change, and self-organizing to be able to do the work as best they can. They're all working and talking together all the time with lots of networking going on. Their behavior follows the dynamical organization's theory openness, synthesis, and emergence that I mentioned earlier in the show. Abundantly sharing information, being in ongoing conversations about the important aspects of their work is how change happens. A simple model that illustrates how change happens is the sand falling from the upper chamber to the lower chamber of an hourglass. If you watch it closely, you will see the sand slowly falling a grain at a time on top of the pile. The potential energy in the pile gradually increases. As more and more sand falls onto the pile, the pile grows. At some point, the sand in the pile slips, releasing some of the potential energy. You cannot predict just when the slip will happen, nor can you predict how big the slippage will be. Most of the time, the slips will be quite small. However, some will be a little larger, a few, and occasionally you'll get a whole situation where the whole pile shifts. This is the same thing that happens in organizations as people talk together, learn, and change. Most of the changes are small, like the story of Steve around the asbestos situation and Eddie around the contractors. 
As I walked the plant every day, I noticed these small changes. If I had stayed in my office, I would never have seen these small changes. Some of the changes were bigger, like the demurrage story. And infrequently, we had a big change happen, which was really exciting. The challenges at the plant, that the people talk together and share information and learn together, these same patterns of the sand falling on the hourglass continued to evolve. Most of the changes were small. Some were bigger and a few were quite large. And you can't predict just which conversation is going to change, but everything builds up and builds up, and at some point the potential energy is high enough and change happens. We had lots and lots of conversations and lots and lots of changes, and we kept getting better and better. Richard, could you just tell us even a bigger story, a very impactful story? We had come together to the point where we could really take on a big challenge. And one of them that we faced was the needing to upgrade our process control systems from the technology of the 1960s up into the technology of the 1990s. And we began to work on this process. And we picked a business that was a critical one for us. It was a $50 million business. And we had our engineering department come in and talk to us about how to do it. And they came back and said, well, it'll cost you $6 million. We'll build a parallel control room. We'll run the processes side by side for a while, and then we'll turn them over after everything is right. And it'll take two years. As we talked together to plan about this, we realized we had neither the time nor the money to do this. And we thought we were advanced enough that we could do it without running parallel. So we began to have project status reviews standing up in the control room every week. Every week, everybody knew what was going on. Operators, mechanics, engineers, managers, supervisors, all of us together. The process began to evolve and moved and people began doing quite extraordinary things. About halfway through, we had our projects ready to be authorized and sent to corporate. So we signed off on projects that totaled 2.9 million, not 6 million. And each of us who had to authorize the project signed the project on each other's backs during the meeting. Normally, this process takes about eight weeks as the paperwork floats around. We kept moving on and on, and we got to our big shutdown where we not only were going to change all the control loops, but we were also going to do the inspections of our distillation columns, relief valves, all the rest of the equipment. So it was a big project, and it was about three weeks. During this, we took out the 100 loops that were critical to take out when the plant was shut down. We had no way to go back. When the plant was put together and we started up, it was amazing. We came up much more quickly than we had ever come up before. We made less off-quality product as we began to stabilize the operation. Our productivity was higher, our quality was better, and we were shipping product within a few days rather than a week. It was quite an extraordinary thing to do. And then we did it on 15 more processes across the plant. We never ran parallel and we never failed. We saved a huge amount of money on this. No one else in the DuPont company ever tried this way of leading or experienced the sort of changes that we were able to make together. They had never tried partner-centered leadership. Many of you have experienced a brief encounter with partner-centered leadership when your organization went through a crisis. We had to plant one, through one when we had a fire in one of our units soon after I first arrived. Our fire brigade responded beautifully and the fire was put out quickly, but the building was a mess and we could not make any product. The wet blanket of our top-down management was thrown off and the people quickly formed high-performance teams and worked together in a beautiful ways to get things done, to get things cleaned up, repaired, and back into operation. Information was widely shared so everyone knew what was happening. The different crafts worked together effectively. Everyone pitched in to get back up and running again. Everyone helped and made decisions. There was so much going on, there was no way that I could stay on top of it try to control it, or even know exactly what was happening in the details. But when the crisis passed, everyone reverted back to our old way, and the wet blanket was pulled over things again. Almost all the things I shared about partner-centered leadership happened as people responded to the crisis. People know how to work this way. We just have to throw off the wet blanket and get moving. And that's what partner-centered leadership does. I want to really thank you for these stories, Richard, because they certainly do illustrate the concepts of partner-centered leadership quite well. And what's really important as our audience thinks about this, in preventing workplace in your workplace, one of the things is if people can get along, if civility reigns, 
so much more can be done to reduce the risks of workplace violence. But this is also about leadership, about moving your organization forward. So let me say this again. You, as the leader and this partner-centered leadership, you can achieve a balance for meeting and exceeding business objectives while developing the environment for nourishing the human spirit and developing the potency of people. That's partner-centered leadership. So we're coming up to a break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking some more and summarize the key points. We're coming to you over the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it intergenerational programming is uniting america due to the tireless efforts of dr ramona frischman retired from the miami-dade county public school system dr frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children young adults and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening live to Richard and Claire Knowles of Nagel Knowles & Associates, your workplace violence prevention experts. You're listening to us via BBM Global, Global Network and TuneIn Radio. In all our years of experience, partner-centered leadership is the very best way to lead. It takes a shift in mindset, like throwing off that wet blanket of traditional top-down management that keeps everyone covered up and like mushrooms in the dark. We let the light and the air come in, freeing everyone up to become the best that they can be in order for the business to grow and prosper. I've shared a lot of information about the right thinking, the right focus, the right complexity tools and processes, the right reasons and purpose for leading this way. I talked about why it works and what it looks like and the things that leaders need to do to help people and the business become the best they can be. The story like Becky's work on the radio show hosts and their plant visit and Donnie's judgment and courage to decide to shut the plant down to, in the electrical storm so we'd not have a fire or a chemical release. I talked about the complexity tools like the process enneagram and the bowl. I also talked about using the sustainability ratios to help make us better decisions. While we shared a lot of information, the processes of partner-centered leadership, they are really quite simple. Organizations change one conversation at a time. We treat everyone with respect. We get clear and aligned on our vision, mission, and principles and standards. We build the bowl. We go into our organizations to have focused, meaningful conversations every day. We look for ways to help each other. We all grow and learn together. This was all built on a foundation of trust and respect. This is an amazing way to lead. So what are some of the results that you achieved that you all work together in doing that you're really proud of, Dick? One of the things was that respect built and the bullying and harassment stopped. The risk of workplace violence went way, way down. People opened up and shared information and learned together. We all looked out for each other, becoming our brothers and sisters keepers. High-performance teams formed all over the plant. 
around work groups and around plant-wide issues. Injury rates dropped by about 97%. Emissions to the air and water and land dropped about 96%. Productivity rose about 45% and earnings rose about 300%. The process of partner-centered leadership is sustainable. And also, I found it a lot more fun to lead this way rather than being the top-down driver as I was learning how to do this work. Our plant became one of the best performers in the entire industry. We kept the plant from being shut down and saved about 1,200 jobs. Recently, Claire and I had the opportunity to return to the plant and talk with a lot of the people who were on this transformational journey with us. It was exciting to share the memories and affirm the great things that we did together. Partner-centered leadership is the best way to lead organizations into the future. The show today focused on the importance of leadership, partner-centered leadership, and how that has such a positive impact in improving total performance and reducing the risk of workplace violence. Nagel and Knowles holds the gold standard in the field of workplace violence risk reduction. If you want to further talk about our work and how it can help you to reduce the violence in your workplace, give us a call. It's 716-622-6467. And for more background, you can order Richard Knowles' Leadership Dance Book from Amazon. For more information about reducing workplace violence, go to our website, nagelknowlesandassociates.com, A-N-D is spelled out, and order our, up our guide to reducing the risk of workplace violence, the absolute essentials. It's free just for your asking for your copy. We are getting the signal that it is time to bring this show to a conclusion. And we hope that it has been useful for you and that you have a better idea of the importance of the role of leadership in reducing workplace violence. We want to make sure we say it again. As the world turns, partner-centered leadership is needed big time, and leaders can achieve that balance of both meeting business objectives and nourishing the human spirit and the potency of people at the same time. We're getting the signal. We will sign off until next week. Please, we say thank you for listening. See you next week. Listen each week for answers to all of your workplace violence concerns here on Nagel & Knowles. If you require help in your workplace setting, contact Nagel & Knowles at 716-622-6467 or log on to nagelknowlesandassociates.com. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.